Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then you ain't black. Welcome back to Mad Owls American Civil War with your host, Bang and Dang, and fresh and hot off of the biggest, bloodiest battle of the war so far, Shiloh. We got um, a pretty interesting one coming up here. Got a small little, a small little uh, skirmish to start out with in Albuquerque. Um, Sibley and Canby are continuing their little thing that they have going on over there, and then uh, we got a pretty decent one at Fort Pulaski, which um, Robert E. Lee is going to show some. He's going to going to be in action today, so good for him, right? Yeah, they're going to pull him off the shelf and put him out there. Yes, so we'll see what's going to happen here. It's a pretty big, pretty long one, so we're only going to have these two battles. Um, coming up here today, but um, looks pretty uh, promising and interesting. First up, Battle of Albuquerque, small engagement in the war in April of 1862 between um, Sibley's Army of the New Mexico and uh, Union Army under Edward R. S. Canby. Um, Canby got about 1,150 people, Sibley 850. I thought these guys were done after the last war or battle in New Mexico, but I guess not. Um, after, not battle, like it. after Glorieta Pass, right. They were on right. the re- retreat from New Mexico after the battle of the Glorieta Pass. On April 8th, Sibley's 4th, 5th, 7th Texas Mounted Volunteers occupied Albuquerque for a second time as they retreated southeast to Texas. <laughs> Colonel Canby moved his army up from Fort Craig, to ascertain, Fort, Craig. Fort Craig to ascertain the strength of the Confederates in Albuquerque. Fire at long range from the edge of town for two days straight. The Union artillery ceased fire when a local citizen informed Camby the Confederates would not permit the civilians to seek shelter. Like, dude, you're murdering our own. Stop. All right. Camby felt right. Camby felt he had accomplished his mission. He knew the rebels were still willing to put up a resistance. The Union demonstration also caused Colonel Tom Green to put his bum on his lips. <laughs> 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 the Union demonstration also caused Colonel Tom Green to hastily pull of pull out of Santa Fe and move to Sibley's aid, hoping to counterattack in the morning. Under cover of darkness, Canby's forces slipped away without the rebels' knowledge. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty much all she wrote for that battle. Because lacking the resources to take a large force captive, Canby hoped the Confederates would concentrate their forces together and move out of New Mexico in one unit. Rebels did indeed end their occupation in Albuquerque a few days later on April 12th. Sibley then left behind the sick and wounded along with eight mountain howitzers buried near the edge of town. That was all buried? Wow. Well, I guess so. That's all she wrote for Albuquerque there, pals. Right. What are you going to do? Nothing happening. and nothing doing. That's what they say in the business. Nothing doing. <laughs> nothing doing. So there's that. Oh, what, but, what business that is, I don't know. Right. The siege of Fort Pulaski, fellers, or the siege and reduction of Fort Pulaski. Oh, they just, with the, they just didn't want to take it over. They want to reduce it. Right. Uh, yeah, the siege of Fort Pulaski concluded with the Battle of Fort Pulaski, fought April 10th and 11th, 1862. Which, which we're obviously covering right now. Right. Union forces on Tybee Island and naval operations conducted a 112-day siege, <laughs> then captured the Confederate-held Fort Pulaski. Holy shit, After a, 112 days? Right. After a 30-hour bombardment, they finally took it over, huh? The siege and battle are important for an innovative use of rifled guns, which made existing coastal defenses obsolete. Yeah, you can do that, right? Rifled guns. Fort Pulaski was built as a third system, quote-unquote, fort in the United States system of coastal defense on land ceded to the United States by the state of Georgia. Authorized- Georgia? Authorized by appropriations begun by Congress under the James Madison administration, construction of the third system forts was directed under U.S. Secretaries of War, including James Monroe of Virginia, William H. Crawford of Georgia, and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Oh, ain't that that nice? Those three fellas there doing what they're supposed to do, right? The new construction replaced two earlier forts on Tybee Island. A British a British colonial? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, a British colonial fort was torn down in the American Revolution. I bet it was. The first United States fort authorized in Washington administration was swept away in an 1804 hurricane. Damn. Construction began on Fort Pulaski during 1830 and was completed in 1845 in an administration of John Tyler. See, John Tyler did do something good, right? I guess. That's what you want to say, good. Right. Uh, The U.S. Secretary of War, John Bell of Tennessee, was the successor that did that. 
No. Who was who was the previous successor? Pleated in eighty five. It was written by a, by a successor of secretary. So don't even name the guy. It's just by oh. a successor of John Bell. All right. Somebody <laughs> not, in not John Horton apparently. All right. Somebody in President Tyler's uh All right. cabinet or administration, I guess. The new fort was named to honor Casimir Pulaski, the Polish hero of the American Revolution. A young lieutenant, Robert E. Lee, served as an engineer during the construction. Wow. At which time he resided in Savannah, Georgia. Yeah. Oh, so this guy. Oh, uh, what? What? I was going to say they had their little triangle in there for a little Freemasonry. Uh, yeah. Uh, this guy should know the ins and outs of the fort then if he was building you, it. You would think so, right? Hmm. Well, well this, an engineer for nothing. Right. This third system fort expanded Savannah's defenses downriver from Old Fort Jackson, a second system fort which had been built nearby the city to defend the immediate approaches to its wharves. Whatever that means. In the campaigns mm-hmm. for national elections in 1860, Southerners threatened to secede from the United States if Lincoln was elected president. Yes, yes. Following the policy of uh, James Buchanan, president, and his Secretary of War, John B. Floyd of Virginia, the newly inaugurated Lincoln administration at first did not garrison and defend forts, arsenals, or U.S. Treasury mints in the South. Why? Well, that's well, that's a I stupid mess up. Why would you not have done that? Maybe they wouldn't have taken over a lot of territory so easily. Right. Even. The policy was continued until April 12th, 1861, when South Carolina militia bombarded Fort Sumter. We know the uh, start right. of the war. That's because it took Lincoln forever to be like, no, nah, they ain't doing nothing. Right. They, might, still... hate, they might hate right. me, but nothing bad like that will happen. Right. He found out quick. Found out quick. January 3rd, 1861, 16 days before the succession of Georgia, volunteer militia seized Fort Pulaski from the federal government and with Confederate forces began repairing and upgrading the armament. In late 1861, the commander, Department of Georgia, General Lawton, was transferred to Richmond. Fifth, General Robert E. Lee assumed command of the newly created Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Look at that shit. Lawton's October report for his department listed 2,753 men. That's it. And officers in the the environs of Savannah, almost half of the command. Okay. Huh. 2,753, huh? That's it, eh? I guess so, for now, anyways. Um... First Georgia regulars had been assigned to Tybee Island. Okay, good for them. The regulars unite or whatever. What did they say? <laughs> uh, regulators. There we go. <laughs> they built a battery on Tybee Island and manned it along with lookouts along the beach. The regiment was reassigned to Virginia, departing July 17, 1861. And then Olmstead's first volunteer regiment of Georgia would garrison Fort Pulaski through the federal siege. Fort Pulaski was considered invincible with a hmm. seven and a half foot solid brick walls. Wow. And reinforcing wow. masonry piers. General Dang. Robert E. Lee had early surveyed the fort's defenses with Colonel Olmstead and determined, he says, they will make it pretty warm for you here with shells, but they cannot breach your walls at that distance. Right. Mm. Mm. They're always so confident, aren't they? They are, aren't they? Mm. Wide, swampy marshes surrounded the fort on all sides, were fested with native alligators. Native. No attacking, right? Native. The illegal alligators haven't came yep. in yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no attacking ship could safely come within effective range. Beyond 700 yards, smoothbore guns and mortars had little had little chance to break through heavy mis- masonry walls. That's true. Uh, beyond 1,000 yards, they had no chance at all. The U.S. Chief, Chief of Engineers, General Joseph Gilbert Totten, is quoted as saying, you might as well bombard the Rocky Mountains. He should have made that into a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Fort Pulaski, you <laughs> might as well bombard the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> if there ever to be a successful siege, it would have to starve the garrison into submission, right? Huh, who says that can't be done? You got to figure out a way to block uh, supplies. Right. Fort Garrison duty with untrained troops made up for lost time. Uh, in May, for example, one newspaper correspondent reported that Confederates spent early morning in heavy labor, such as mountain heavy guns. <laughs> then came an hour and a half drill at the heavy guns with instruction or live fire out a mile or two. Uh, the proficiency of each gun crew Dang. was tracked in target practice. Troops were tested on gunnery skills, then ate dinner at one. One o'clock, dinner. Well, that's lunch. That's what they call it. Supper is dinner. Right. The rotating fatigue parties returned to work while officers reviewed infantry tactics, then instructed the men for an hour. Fatigue parties had recall at six. Nice. Then at dress parade retreat, the garrison performed infantry drill, including combat formation evolutions. Supper was followed by an hour's recitation 
of Army regulation with taps performed at nine. Jeez. Well, you know what? At <laughs> least this is probably the first battle we've ever that we've covered so far where they're preparing as crazy as they are now. Right, and this is south. Exactly. Well, it's it's a, a hell of a fort to to try to keep. I would be training some bitches yeah, too. Well, there was a lot of other things that was important to keep that nobody trained. <sighs> Operationally, General Robert, General Robert E. Lee headquartered in Savannah as commander of the Department of the Coast of Southern Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, as we said before. He was returning to the fort that he had helped construct in his early U.S. career. It's like going back home. Right. I'm going home. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had been instrumental and connected with channeling tidewaters around the fort where a hurricane had swept a previous structure on the same site. He knew the lay of the land and the tides of the sea. Look at him. Look at the land and the tides of the sea. When federal mm-hmm. forces first made a lodgment on Tybee Island, the work on Fort Pulaski was progressing slowly for Robert E. Lee's judgment as the district's commanding general was that the river cannot be forced, he says. Old Fort, right. Old Fort Jackson right. had been armed, strengthened, and forms an interior barrier, he says. Again, Savannah's channel had been blocked. In December, Lee reasoned since the federals had sunk a stone fleet in the Charleston Harbor, they did not intend to use it. Why? Wow. Uh, he says, we must endeavor to be prepared against assaults everywhere or elsewhere on the southern coast. To that end, additional right. ships were sunk by Confederates and water approaches that led behind uh, Fort Pulaski. Yeah, might as well, right? Ain't right. no ships getting to. in. We're sink all these ones. Can't nobody get in now. Lee brought Commodore Tatnall from a James River command, where under imminent attack from Union monitors, he had landed sailors to expand Richmond fortifications immediately after the Battle of Hampton Roads. Tatnall then manned batteries with his gunners to repel monitor attacks, threatening to bombard Richmond's Tredegar, Tredegar Ironworks. Tatnall sailors would perform similar service at a battery across from Savannah's Fort Jackson. Turning his attention to Fort Pulaski's defenses, Lee anticipated Union moves to establish batteries above the fort. Yeah. He ordered he ordered guns positioned to cover their likely positions where the Federals to get behind. Yeah, where the Federals to get behind Pulaski in a siege attempt. He's like, just in case these little assholes come up behind us, I want guns mm. trained on where they would come. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> In January, following Tatnall's three gunboat attack on seven federal gunboats on the river, Lee's assessment was that there is nothing to prevent their reach from the Savannah River, and we have nothing afloat that can tend against them. Oh. Um, Fort Pulaski, which was the third system, obviously we have mentioned that, scientifically engineered coastal defense fort, still had at least four months' provisions. Oh, they're, they're there for a while then. Right. Um, now the primary objective became we must endeavor to defend the city. The city's floating dock was sunk as another river obstruction. Good for them. Hey. They're, they're preparing for some shit right here, dude. Damn right. They don't want to lose this damn fort. Mm-hmm. In March, General Lee passed the long war department orders to begin transferring regiments from Florida to Tennessee to reinstate operations following the disasters to our arms there, he says. Mm. Georgian troops had been sent to Virginia in July. Additional Georgians would be moved to Tennessee also. The Confederate government required a withdrawal from seaboard forces into the interior of South Carolina and Georgia to better secure the bed- breadbasket plantations feeding the armies. Yeah, that's smart. In Florida, only the Apalachicola River, that's a terrible name, had to be defended at all costs because federal gunboats could penetrate so deeply into the interior. Yeah, you got to you gotta stop major uh, waterways that get into your land, bud. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't be allowed them in Florida. Right. Uh, on Lee's transfer to Richmond, he detailed urgent defense construction. Then he called on Lawton's earnest and close attention to the Federal's probable approach to the city. He said, it looks now as if he would take the Savannah River. Okay. Guns located on island batteries were to be removed to the mainland in and around Savannah's defensive lines. Obstructions in the river above the city were to be set by hands provided by upriver planters in the event of an envelopment by way of Fort McAllister. So, okay. Look at General Lee. He's thinking of everything, isn't he? Damn right. Damn right. Every effort must be made, uh, as what Lee is saying, to retard or prevent further progress of the enemy directly upriver on the Savannah River approaches. If he attempts to advance by batteries on the marshes or islands, he must be driven back, if possible. Scouts were ordered out so as to discover his first lodgment. And when they can be broken up, an additional three gun battery at McKay's point was not intended to stop federal gunboats in force. But with Tantanel's gunboat support, they could prevent federal batteries from being built on Elba Island to threaten old Fort Jackson. Okay. While Savannah's existing Fort Jackson, about three miles downriver from the city, was supplemented with two additional batteries. Defenders built fire Uh, barges. Good for you. Uh, Lee first placed a battery at Costin's Bluff, commanding navigable estuaries (laughs) leading to the... 
Savannah River behind Fort Pulaski. Then he added another battery situated farther up river on Elba Island, um, blocking all river approach to Savannah. The Union Naval Commander Admiral Samuel F. DuPont conducted a reconnaissance of Lee's hmm. system of defensive upriver. When the commanding military general, General Thomas W. Sherman, we got some Sherman back, insisted on forcing Lee's ri riverine batteries against DuPont's recommendation, Thomas Sherman was transferred to the Western Theater and replaced by General David Hunter. Oh. <laughs> so, oh. uh, old DuPont had the upper hand there. He was like, nah, Sherman, you got to go, bud. Right. He's Sherman a commanding bad. military general, too. All right. He's wow. OP. The Union fleet conducted explorations. Among the Atlantic inlets and coastal marshes by shallow draft ships, boats, and monitors. But when they came up against earthworks such as Fort McAllister, just south of Savannah, their efforts using bombardment alone were fruitless. The Federals would not advance on Savannah until General William T. Sherman's march from the interior in 1864. Dang. Uh, got a couple years till that's coming. Dang. So who was that other Sherman? Thomas Sherman. Thomas he's not. Sherman. But he was the acting military general commanding. Isn't that William Sherman? Tecumseh William Tecumseh Sherman is the big guy. Oh, right, 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 right. At the time, Pulaski was cut off from Savannah in April of 1862. The garrison under the command of Colonel Charles H. Olmsted had been reduced from 650 to 385 officers and men. They were organized into five infantry companies and had 48 cannons, including 10 Columbiads, five mortars, and a four and a half inch Blakely rifle. Uh, the Confederate Tybee Island battery had been previously dismantled and abandoned, and their guns relocated to the fort. Hey. The fort had been provisioned on January 28th with a six-month supply of food. All right, good. I think you at least put a year. All right. <laughs> in consultation with Lee, Olmsted had distributed armament on the ramparts and in the casements to cover all approaches. Several were placed to cover westerly marshes in Savannah's north channel. All right. Confederate marauders burned Sea Island cotton crops to deny them falling into federal hands. Hmm. Why don't you just pick them? Right. Well, they weren't, they weren't ready yet. Yeah, who knows? Navigational aids like the Tybee Lighthouse were dismantled and burned. Yeah, like we ain't giving them no fucking... Uh, Nothing. Good uh, navigational stuff. Nothing. <laughs> Report from the field had Confederate troops setting fires to everything that might be used by advancing Federal troops. Everything. So, oh yeah, Lee already said... We can't really stop them from coming here, but we can stop them from getting into this damn fort, though. All right. Uh, August of 1861, Secretary of War Cameron had authorized a combined expeditionary corps of Army and Navy. Brigadier General Thomas W. Sherman commanded Army elements and Flag Officer DuPont commanded the Navy. The Union forces intended to recapture Fort Pulaski as federal property to close the Port of Savannah to the rebels and to extend their blockade southward. First, they needed a coiling station a colon station for the uh, blockade in South Atlantic Squadron. Coiling? Okay. Co colon? Coal. Coaling. Coaling station, right. Hmm. It then could serve as a base for expedition. Mm. Fort Sumner would not be retaken until 1865, but the Battle of Port Royal answered the immediate requirement for a nearby staging area. So that worked out for him. As Union forces went about taking Port Royal, Commodore Josiah Tattenell III CSN and his mosquito fleet mounted an, an active defense, harassing elements of the Union's South Atlantic Squadron. Over the next few months, Stanton all, an experienced U.S. Navy commander, Port trained in Royal, fighters, Battle of Port Royal Sound. Now, yeah, we did that episode. Go back and look at it. Right. An experienced U.S. Navy commander is Stanton all, trained and fought his Confederate squadron into a flexible task force for coastal amphibious resupply and riverine operations. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good for that and all. Yeah. That mosquito fleet. Everybody remembers that, right? Um, right. With the approach of the federal expedition on Port Royal, including 15 warships under the command of flag officer DuPont, the Confederate Savannah river squadron sortied with gunships, CSS Savannah, which was the flagship, the Samson, the lady Davis and the tender resolute. These four, along with the converted slaver privateer Bonita, met eight of DuPont's 15 U.S. warships on November 5th and were outgunned and outclassed. Dang. They sure were. 15 of them, huh? What are you going to do? Get outgunned and outclassed. Right. That's usually the case with uh, <laughs> what's going on there, huh? Right, 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 right. They withdrew overnight into Skull Creek, Georgia. The next day, they attacked again. Mm -hmm. Under cover and fires from Old Savannah engaging nearby heavy Union ships, the Samson assisted amphibious operations, taking off numbers 
of the Port Royal Garrison. Resolute, returning from, de- returning from delivering dispatches to the city of Savannah, evacuated the garrison at Fort Walker. She then landed at Pope's Landing, Hilton Head Island, and spiked Confederate guns abandoned there. Oh, jeez. Yeah, man. Can't get anything in uh, federal hands to establish that. The Savannah landed a shore party of Marines to support Fort Bar- Borgard. Under five from Union warships, but the fort was lost before reinforcements could arrive. Yeah. The ship took off. The shit took off. The ship took off the garrison and returned to Savannah for repairs. Yeah, gotta go. Got uh, to go. After building up facilities on Hilton Head Island, the Federals began preparations for besieging Fort Pulaski. The Union expedition next captured Tybee Island. Uh, the Union then advanced on Fort Pulaski uh, beginning on November 24th, 1861. Following reconnaissance that Confederates had abandoned Tybee Island, Flag Officer DuPont ordered forward an amphibious raid with three gunboats at the Tybee Island Lighthouse. Under a two-hour ship's bombardment, the Confederate pickets set fire to the lighthouse and withdrew. Uh-oh. Commander Christopher Rogers um, mm-hmm. of the USS Flag led a landing party of sailors and Marines and 13 surf boats to occupy the lighthouse and the Martello Tower and flew the national flag from them. Overnight, a reduced company set false campfires to misdirect the Confederates ashore. Oh, little, look at that. Little uh, little misdirections there, huh? All right. Two days after commanding flag officer DuPont and General Thomas Sherman made a personal recontinence. And on November 29th, General Gilmore, the command's chief engineering officer, with three companies of 4th New Hampshire, took formal possession of the entire island without opposition. Mm. The Navy set the logistics train in motion. And by sem- December 20th, the Army has sufficient materials for establishing a permanent possession. The last blockade runner to make Savannah was the British steamship Fingal. A British steamship, huh? All right. Uh, its cargo of arms and munitions reached the entrance to Wasaw Sound at the mouth of the Savannah River on a clear night in mid-November. Do you remember the clear night in mid-November? But heavy fog in the early morning masked the ship's progress across the bar and up river. Later, she made two unsuccessful attempts at escaping the blockade before being converted into an ironclad. Okay. Hey. Lasky's share on ship's manifest was two 24-pounder Blakely rifles and a large consignment of British-made hey. Enfield infantry rifles. As Union flag okay. officer DuPont sought to close the alternative channels local ships used, he sank stone-filled ships in the Savannah River Channel and stationed gunboats at two southerly estuaries, the Wausau Sound, South of Wilmington Island and Osaba Sound at Skidaway Island. What the hell is going on over there? Do you think after the war they went and got all this shit out of the rivers? I'm sure. Right, you'd have to. You gotta traverse them again, right? Right. It's 26 November, Tetanos flagship CSS Old Savannah in company with Resolute and Samson. They attacked Port Philoxy's guns in a brave but brief attack to the Union ships outside the bar, driving them out to sea. Tatnell's squadron withdrew up to the Savannah River for refit, and two days later, the same three resupplied the fort with six months' provisions. Despite the spirited opposition of the federal ships, Ooh. Old Savannah was particularly disabled but returned to harbor. Samson received a considerable damage, returned to patrol the Savannah River only in mid-November of the following year. Hmm. So he got some damage, but it helped. Yeah, got them their supplies. Right. Uh, the U.S. siege plan would make military history. Quincy Adams Gilmore was General Thomas Sherman's chief engineer and officer. His professional reading had followed the test records of the experimental rifled gun, which the Army had begun testing in 1859. Wow. Right. Following a reconnaissance of the ground, he proposed the unconventional plan to reduce Fort Pulaski with mortars and rifled guns. Sherman approved the plan, but not the promise of the rifled guns. His endorsement was qualified, believing gunnery effect would be limited to, quote unquote, shake the walls in a random manner. Right. But the innovative weaponry in the event made his deployed 10,000 man assault force unnecessary. Right. Right. Uh, of the two senior military commanders leading up to the engagement, neither Union General Thomas Sherman nor Confederate General Robert E. Lee believed the fort could be captured by bombardment alone. No, definitely not. Seven yeah. and a half foot thick walls, dude. I mean, come on. Gee, and marshes all around it. There ain't no right. way. And uh, native alligators. Right. <laughs> Two sites for the federal batteries were selected up, up river from the fort to cut it off from Savannah, just as Lee anticipated. He was like, I knew that shit was going to happen. I knew that shit was going to happen. Told you, boys. Mm-hmm. The first was at Point Venus at the east end of Jones Island along the north bank of the Savannah River North Channel. Confederate Commodore Josiah Tattenall III had sunk a stone schooner 
to obstruct the northward channel connecting the river to the Union held Port Royal. And he patrolled the river with the Confederate gunboats. Fantastic. The Federals had to clear the obstruction on their most direct supply line first. It required three weeks. Jeez. So that slowed them down some. A camp and supply depot was established on the next island north, Dufuski Island. Dufuski's going on here. Right. <laughs> uh, Dufuski? Tatnall's gunboats still commanded the lower river around Point Venus. As a part of Lee's active defense, the Confederate Savannah River Squadron launched continuous patrols. Right. Their naval gunnery required the work along the river by Union besiegers to be done at night. Uh, the Federal's guns had to be pulled by hand through swamp over movable tram check sections, and the men working in brackish alligator-infested marsh while sinking in over their waist most of the day. Ooh, that's sketchy, dude. I wonder if anybody got eight. Damn, I bet uh, they did. The artillery then had to be placed on a board and bag platform to avoid their loss by sinking into the morass. The soldiers rested mm. during the day. Oh, geez, oh, peach. Well, like we said earlier, by Lee's this, estimation. They're doing this in the nighttime in the alligator right. infested waters. That's feeding time, dude. You ain't kidding. Mm. There's some crazy. As we said earlier, by Lee's estimation, the fort could not be reduced by bombardment or direct assault, only by starvation, he says. And he says, as long as supplies could be built up, they would be. Well, the last Confederate supply ship to Fort Pulaski was the small workhorse steamboat Ida. February 13th, it was on routine run to the fort down the north channel the new battery of the federal heavy guns on the north bank opened up for the first time the old side wheeler ran for pulaski and the battery got off nine shots before the guns recoiled off their platforms union troops went back to work modifying platform construction and resetting the cannon two days later ida ran up the south channel under the extinguished lighthouse and returned to savannah through tybee creek dang got lucky i'm gone <laughs> oh shit once a Union battery at Venus Point was disclosed, Confederate gunboats engaged in gunnery duels, but they were driven off. Right. Over the next week, the besiegers completely surrounded the fort. Uh-oh. Federals built another battery on the Savannah River across from Venus Point. They threw a boom across Tybee Creek and cut the telegraph line between Savannah and Cockspur Island. Uh, two infantry companies entrenched nearby to ward off Confederate raiding activity, and a gunboat was detailed to patrol the channel and support the infantry. Late uh, February 1862, no supplies or reinforcements could get in, and the uh -oh. Confederate garrison could not get out. Uh oh. Oh, what was that about starving? <laughs> the last link right. of communications was a weekly swamp swimming cur courier. Holy shit. Uh oh. Jeez, dude. Oh. <laughs> hey, get uh, go get uh, good old, good old Anderson out here. Yeah, Let's go get Anderson out here. <laughs> hey, bud, you want to swim across that dare swamp right there? Wow. At the end of February, Tantanaw laid plans for an amphibious assault on the two advanced batteries at the Venus Point and Oakley Island. General Lee personally interceded. Preparations at Old Fort Jackson were not completed. Although Tantanaw's flagship had been put back into service since the squadron's January resupply attack. One of the three gunboats was still seriously disabled. Lee reasoned that if Tatnaw's plan failed, the city itself would be open to attack, which is true. The three to seven exchange had not gone well for the defenders of Savannah. A possible two to seven match against ships with superior armament did not promise better. Yeah, you think? Mm. Uh, no further consideration was given to relief of the floor. No further consideration was given to relief of the fort. In any case, it had perhaps 16 weeks of provisions left. Mm. That's not bad. Meanwhile, federate, uh, federal emplacements continued to improve on Jones and Bird Islands, Venus Point, and other points along the river. During the federal bombardment of Fort Pulaski, April 10th through the 11th, Old Savannah participated in counter-battery fire with the besieging Union guns. Good for her. Jeez. Oh, oh, why ain't the Confederates sending more troops to help? Yeah, they're, they're surrounded now. They can't. What are they going to do? They literally have the, the, Union has, uh, the Union has shit yeah, they above, got around the whole fort. They, they cut off every supply. Right, they got the swamp courier. He can run out and tell somebody and get some troops moved in there. Yes, but what are they going to do? Start fighting. Well, yeah, okay. Nobody from inside the fort has to fight, but you can at least break down some of the, the surroundment, right? Yeah, I guess. Heavy caliber rifle cannon, which the Federals needed to reduce Pulaski, had arrived, at which time Gilmore decided to locate the batteries at the northwestern tip of Tybee Island nearest the fort. By March, Gilmore was offloading siege material onto Tybee Island. Roads had, be, had to be laid. Gun emplacements evac excavated. Magazines and bomb proofs constructed as the work progressed southwesterly nearing the fort. And last mile, the Union troops came under fire from the fort's Confederate gunners. Of course, they did. Uh, last mile, right? Uh, arranging shot, arranging shot, 
said to be aimed by Colonel Olmsted himself cut a Union soldier in two. Mm. The following bombardment from elevated fort guns affected mortar barrages that forced all construction to proceed on Tybee Island by night. Yeah. Each morning, the uncompleted elements of siege construction were camouflaged against the fort spotters. Yeah, I can't let them oh. do any air. Right. To land the cannon onto Tybee Island, artillery pieces were taken off transports, set on rafts at high tide, and pitched into the surf near shore. At low tide, manpower would alone would drag the guns up the beach. Jeez. 250 men were required to move a 13-inch mortar along a sling cart. Oh, my. Jeez. Later, later, Union amphibious operations would employ contraband labor for much of this work. Escaped slaves. <laughs> uh, that's yeah. what they call them, contraband. Right. And she's in there. And the Civil War is about ending slavery. We're here to uh, free these guys, but we're going to call right. them contraband. <laughs> right. Get out of here. Along the two and a half mile front, their engineers had to construct almost a mile of corduroy road made wow. of bundles of brushwood to keep the guns from sinking into the swamp. That's a hard work there, bud. While the offloading proceeded day and night, according to the tides, Confederate bombardment from Fort Pulaski gunners required all federal movement into the island limited to nighttime yeah. only. Do it under dark, man. Mm. Uh, after a month of work, 36 mortars, heavy guns, and rifled cannon were in position. Jeez. One of the 13-inch mortars of Battery Halleck at 2,400 yards range was given the task of signaling the open opening of the bombardment. The battery would proceed by shelling the archers of the north and northeast faces with plunging fire, quote unquote, exploding after striking, not before. Okay. Right. So I don't want these. I don't want these uh, um, shells exploding before they hit. All right. The four batteries closest to the fort were each given specific fire and mission missions. Battery McClellan at a range of 1,650 yards with two eighty four pounder and two sixty four pounder James rifled cannon which were old 42 and 32 pounders rifled oh, was to breach the pan coupe between the <laughs> South and Southeast faces and the adjacent embrasure at pan coupe is a blunted point of a multi-faced fortification. Oh, so it's like a, if it was a star, it'd be the point of the star, you know? Right. Right. Okay. Or blunted point. No, the, so it'd right. be, no, it, yeah, it'd be, it'd the, be like, the edge. Right. 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 Uh, battery seagull. Seagal, 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 Seagal. Did we do this? Did yeah. we do this before? Well, Seagal's been definitely here before, yeah. With Bugsy. Yeah. Is it yeah. Seagal? <laughs> Seagal, it's Bugsy Seagal, Seagal. Right? Bugsy Seagal. Seagal. <laughs> <laughs> Battery Seagal at 1,670 yards included the five 30-pounder Parrots and a 48-pounder James rifled cannon, formerly a 20-pounder smoothbore. Their mission was to fire on the... Hey, look at these guys. They figured out how to rifle, dude. Now they're rifling right. everything. I would. Wouldn't you? Why, why not, right? All right. The mission was to fire on the barbat guns until silenced, then switch to percussion shells on the southeast walls and adjacent embrasure at a rate of 10 to 12 rounds an hour to affect wall penetration for the planned infantry assaults to come later. Oh, jeez. Battery Totten at a range of 650, 1,650 yards with four 10-inch siege mortars, was assigned to explode shells over the northeast and southeast walls where any hidden batteries outside the fort. Jeez, these guys are just pounding them. Pounding them. Yeah. And what did the fort have? I, I don't even remember. I don't think Not we know that one, much shit. Uh, yeah, it was like 48 guns or something, right? Right. Uh, Battery Scott at 1,740 yards with his three 10-inch and one 8-inch Columbiads was to fire a solid shot and breach the same area as Battery McClellan. Fire was to cease at dark except for special directions, and in the event, intermittent harassment was sustained on the fort overnight. A signal officer was stationed at Battery Scott to communicate the ranging of the mortared batteries Stanton, Grant, and Sherman. Dude, they got they got every single one of their big uh, right. generals here, dude. Everybody's here. Jeez. This must be a major little thing here, bud. It's only a Class B battle. Right. Wow. Yeah, here we got all the uh, batteries. Everybody's here, dude. Grant, right. Lyon. Burnside, Sherman, Halleck, Scott, Siegel, McClellan, everybody. This is the first Jeez, step into oh. getting to Richmond, though. So right, rain squalls on the ninth prevented attack. Wait, rain squalls on the ninth prevented action, but all was ready for the Federals by April tenth. Mm. And the newly appointed commander of the department, Major General David Hunter, sent a demand for immediate surrender and restoration of Fort Pulaski to the authority and possession of the United States Army. 
Colonel Olmstead replied, I'm here to defend the fort, not to surrender it. Hey, didn't we hear that before? Yeah, uh, fucking <laughs> white from uh, the last right. one. And then he Jeez, ended up surrendering the, anyways. All right. Well, the, bombard, the bombardment began at 8 a.m., concentrating on the fort's southeast corner, which suffered greatly. The Confederate gunnery was described by the federal commander as efficient and accurate firing. Great precision. Not only at our batteries, but even at the individual persons passing between them. Well, wow. All that training up. worked. All right. Uh, as the day wore on, counter-battery fire from Fort Pulaski were gradually silenced as their guns were either dismounted or rendered unserviceable. Right. Two of the federal 10-inch Columbiads jumped backwards off their carriages. Uh-oh. The 13-inch mortars placed less than 10% rounds on target. Wow. Wow. Uh, but federal pro- federal fire proved effective from Parrot and James rifles and working Columbiad guns. There ensued a law from the fort, but the Confederate gunners reopened an energetic counter-battery duel that required the Parrots to give up their wall assignment and concentrate on the working Confederate guns until they were re-silenced. By nightfall, mm-hmm. the wall at the southeast corner had been breached. Uh-oh. Oh, uh, under periodic harassment, Under periodic harassing bombardment throughout the hours of darkness, Olmsted's garrison put several guns back into service. Uh, yeah. It's nighttime oh, now. It's time to fix your shit up. Right. Ain't nobody sleeping tonight, that's for sure. Right. Well, overnight, DuPont's flagship USS Wabash detached 100 crew to man four of the 300-pound parrot rifles. 30-pound parrot rifles, sorry. In the morning, with the wind picking up right to left and affecting shell trajectory, the unit artillery resumed the bombardment, concentrating fire to enlarge the opening. The Georgia gunners again found targets, described in dispatches as rebel, firing good all morning, doing some damage. At the same time, parrot rifles and Columbia hits opened a great gap into the wall. Sending shot across the interior of the fort and against the Northwest Powder Magazine containing 20 tons of powder. <whistles> Regarding his situation as hopeless, Olmstead surrendered the fort at 2.30 <laughs> p.m. that day. All right. <laughs> He's like, you know what? Maybe I will surrender. <laughs> I may not be. I may not have come here to surrender, but stuff changes. Man. <laughs> That's right. That's, uh, wow. That's the way it goes down, I guess. Right. Uh Jeez. General Gilmore reported in his after-action assessment of the siege by his artillery, he said, good rifled guns properly served can breach rapidly. Damn sure they can, apparently. Uh, at 1,600 to 2,000 yards when they are followed by heavy round shot to knock down loose masonry. Yeah, dude, they just pounded those walls, man. Dude, them walls are freaking, if you see pictures here, oh my. Yeah, looking at it now, holy shit. And that's still today. Uh, right. The 84 pounder James is unexcelled in breaching, but its grooves must be kept clean. And yeah, 84 pounder ones. Well, they learned right. some stuff, didn't they? Uh, the 13 inch yeah. mortars had little effect, of course. The new 30 pounder parrot rifle had made a major impact on the battle. The rifle cannon fired significantly further with more accuracy and greater destructive impact than the smooth bores, obviously. Its application achieved tactical surprise unanticipated by senior commanders of either side. Oh, wow. Wow. Damn, dude, they annihilated those walls. Look at that. Oh, the port of Savannah. The port of Savannah was closed to the Confederacy early, extending the Union blockade. Damage to the fort was repaired in six weeks, and the Confederates made no attempt to retake it. Why would they? they knew better. Right. They, they, didn't, they didn't have what the Union just had there. They couldn't do that. The city of Savannah itself remained in Confederate hands until the arrival of Major General William T. Sherman in December of 1864. Sherman's March to Sea. Uh, Post war, right? right. Post war, it was determined that heavy rifled cannon made masonry fortifications obsolete, right. revolutionizing coastal defense as much as the Battle of the USS Modern and CAA, CAA Virginia had for warships. You guys remember right. that one, the, the uh, first mm-hmm. Battle of the Ironclads? The rapid reduction of Fort Pulaski was used to justify stopping work on masonry forts and led to a brief period of new construction of earthwork forts in the 1870s. Yeah, they're like, wait, Mayor. We just figured out these rifled freaking cannons and guns. They do some damage. Lessons learned by the Union were not adopted until the war was over. They didn't learn nothing, apparently. In its no. December 1864 <laughs> attack on Fort Fisher, the bombardment was diffuse and scattered without any real damage to the fort made by the many shots aimed at the fort's flagpole. Wow. Admiral Porter adopted General Gilmore's gunnery tactics for the second attack, assigning targets until they were destroyed. The January 1865 bombardment dismounted 73 of the fort's 75 guns, mostly shot away the fort's palisade. Um, so they're saying they didn't. I don't, I don't get that at all. Right. They didn't. Okay. What they learned from this, what they, they learned from it. this battle, they didn't use until the war was over, apparently. Is that what they're saying? Gee, 
Wow, jackasses. Right. Well, on the Confederate side, Commodore Josiah Tattnall III's effort to break the Union blockade at Savannah extended the modern era armored warships with ironclad CSS Atlanta in 1862, CSS Savannah in 1863. To elaborate Savannah's defenses, a torpedo station was established under military command. The ironclad USS Montauk survived the detonation of a torpedo while attacking Fort McAllister in 1863. Given shortages in marine engines, the Confederate Navy built floating battery CSS Georgia in 1863. Closure of the gaps and connections between railroads in Savannah, Augusta, and Charleston allowed timely movement of troops and supplies to be- besiege Charleston from late 1862 through 1864. So they needed that low area right there, man. That fort would have been perfect still for them. Well, as opposed to the Union, lessons learned by the Confederates were immediately incorporated into defenses of Charleston, South Carolina. On his release <laughs> as prisoner of war, Colonel Olmstead was assigned engineer and gunnery duty there. See, look at this dude got released and it went immediately back. Like, why would you release him? Right. Uh, repeated Union naval and amphibious assaults failed from 1862 to 1865. Uh, both Union gunboats and ironclads repeatedly suffered substantial damage and loss by Confederate gunnery and mines. So they learned their, uh, at least they learned from it, I guess. What right. are they doing, Look Union? This. General David Hunter from the Union issued his General Order Number 11 on May 9th, 1862, that all slaves in Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina were free. <laughs> wow. How can he do that? Well, he can't. All right. President Lincoln quickly rescinded it reserving this supposed power to his own discretion if it were indispensable to saving the Union. Abolition was to be outside the police functions of field commanders. Nevertheless, Pulaski became a terminal on the Underground Railroad, initiating freedman education and supplying many of the 517 African-American Georgians serving in the U.S. Navy between 1862 and 1865. Good for them, though, right? Right. Uh, for the Confederates in 18, uh, late 1864, 520 Confederate officer prisoners, officer prisoners were transferred to Fort Pulaski. The fort's commander, Colonel Philip P. Brown Jr., attempted to restore full food rations upon arrival, but was ordered not to by the district commander who put the men on starvation rations. Wow. On December wow. 15th, after district command change and medical inspection on January 27th of 1865, resulted in the restoration of normal rations. Jeez. No shit. What the hell was this? They were doing some Hitler shit. Yeah, this uh, brown guy is a douchebag. Wow. As many as 55 men died before they were sent to Fort Delaware in March of 1865. These prisoners were the Confederacy's immortal 600. <laughs> what, about, what a dick, dude. Right. Uh, Fort, all right. Fort Pulaski, is, uh, Fort Pulaski is located on a barrier in island near Savannah, Georgia, obviously. It is open to the public today as the Fort Pulaski National Monument and Museum. It is a third system fort in the U.S. system of coastal defense. The scientifically designed fort construction was supervised by Robert E. Lee. Yes. And the fort's 112 days defense in depth was put in place under his command, as we said before. Construction of the third system forts were directed under Secretaries of War William H. Crawford of Georgia and John Calhoun of South Carolina, as we previously mentioned. Yeah, then we got Old Fort Jackson. It's uh, in the city of Savannah. Um, wow, it, it, it was used in the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and the Civil War, dude. Dang. Um, the second system of forts was begun under the administration of Thomas Jefferson. It is maintained by the Coastal Heritage Society. Good for them. Right, good stuff. Fort McAllister, a Confederate earthworks that defeated the Union Monitor attack six times. Jeez. It's reserved. As the Fort McAllister Historic Park. Oh, all right. Well, hmm. rifled guns, dude. Okay, we got rifled. some new shit going on in the war now. Some, but uh, clearly, the Union didn't learn nothing. Some heavy them. artillery there. That was bad. that was only a B battle too. It seemed pretty significant to me more than to be a B battle. But right, um, right, should have been A all day. Right, A all day. Uh, that was April tenth through the eleventh. Coming up on the fourteenth of April, we got the Battle of Peralta which is in New Mexico. So they're still uh, doing some New Mexico stuff. Huh? And then uh, the next day, April 15th, the battle of Pachacho pass in Arizona, which was New Mexico Pachacho. territory at the time. Right. And then um, I'm assuming those two battles are relatively small. So I'm sure we'll end next week's episode with the class a battle battle of forts Jackson and St. Philip, which we just discussed a little bit here, <laughs> which took place April 18th to the 28th. And then we got, Capture New Orleans coming up uh, in a couple weeks. Siege of Corinth. 
Battle of Williamsburg. That's a lot. Of, lots of lots of stuff here coming up. Um, huh? What a battle that was. Good stuff. Um, rifled guns are now a thing. So let's see if um, Federates figure out how to do it. Hmm. Mm. I think they would, right? You think so? Um, especially, hopefully, or hopefully, I say, but uh, maybe they can capture some of the Confederates ones and see how they did it. But we'll see. Coming down the line, got a lot of stuff coming up. Only not even in the middle of 1862 yet. So we got lots and lots and lots of stuff coming up. And uh, other stuff, if you guys enjoyed this episode, go check out our other show that we do called Outlaws and Gunslingers, where it's pretty much the same concept as this, except for recover. Um, immediately after this, we started the show with, um, the wild west stuff right after the civil war ends. So, um, prohibition, we did Jonestown, Unabomber, Oklahoma city bomber gangs, um, bunch of bank robberies we've done. OJ Simpson case. We just finished up Ruby Ridge and we got a lot more stuff coming up, including a whole breakdown of the, uh, mafia and every single family and notable person for those guys. So. Go check that out. Battles, not battles, um, outlaws and gunslingers. And on this very same network, Bang Dang Network, you can go check out our other show this week in sports history where we go through the week of important and not so important sports facts and <laughs> stuff, I like guess. Five inning, like five inning no hitters. Yeah, that don't exist anymore, but stuff like that. Five. <laughs> this week in uh, sports <laughs> history, covering all the good stuff over there. Um, Bang Dang Network, go look us up over there and we'll be back next week for at least three battles, most importantly the battles of Fort Jackson uh, nice class A battle so we'll be back then, we're the Mouth of Michiganders with Bang Dang